Welcome, and thanks for coming. Uh, this is complete disaster recovery of stateful workloads, persistent volumes, and CSI snapshots via Flux and with Vault. Um, my name is Kingdon. I'm a Flux maintainer. I work at Weaveworks in the developer experience department as an open source support engineer. Take a picture of this if you want uh, to visit us later or keep abreast of all the GitOps things that are happening. Um, we have a nice website where you can see the Flux-centric view of uh, GitOps days and everything else at KubeCon. Okay, so here's our agenda. Uh, we're gonna learn about Kubernetes CSI. And we're gonna use a lovely little tool called Helm, which you may have heard of, that makes working with CSI volumes a little bit more approachable. Um, okay, so CSI, uh, over by and large, not a beginner topic. So why is this a beginner talk? This actually is in the schedule as a beginner talk, if you didn't notice that. So um, how, how is this a beginner talk? Well, we're gonna start small and we're gonna build upon what we know or what we've learned. Uh, so here's our scenario for today. This is what we're gonna start with. We are going to install some chart using Helm. Um, I have picked Bookstack, completely random. Uh, it has enough persistent volumes to be a useful example for this demo. Uh, okay, and how does this work? Well, a persistent volume claim in the template is instantiated, and then Kubernetes fulfills the claim with a persistent volume. Okay, so why is persistent data different than other declarative resources? Well, they're stateful. Persistent volumes are stateful. They may contain information. Um, they may contain information. <laughs> uh, persistent volumes contain a state. They have an identity. They cannot be wiped and recreated without spoiling the statefulness. So um, I bet you can guess um, what happens when the persistent volume goes away, when the claim goes away. I bet you can guess, but we're not here for guessing. We're going to see. So we are going to install Bookstack. Uh, that's the example. And I actually had to search for a while before I could find the maintained Helm chart for Bookstack. Uh, so does it have to be Bookstack? Again, this is just for example, we've chosen this chart. No, it does not. What are the requirements to make a useful demo here? Well, we want to see something in the values.yaml file of our chart. We want to see the words existing claim. Um, because that will allow us to use an existing volume, uh, an existing volume later. Uh, so, and would you look at this? Actually, uh, there's no such field in the values.yaml. So we're going to have to, we, we are going to have to pick a different card. <laughs> uh, so why is this not a good example? Because if you look, here's the persistent volume claim. Um, it's not wrapped in any conditionals. Uh, so this one creates a PVC. It's not moving. Oh, okay. There, that one. Um, creates a, you everybody see? Okay. It can creates a persistent volume unconditionally. Uh, so we've chosen poorly. We need that existing claim field for a reason. I'll be illustrating shortly. So let's, it's not moving forward. Okay, here we are. This is the slide. We, we need that existing claim field. And sometimes a bad example is a good example. Okay, so I was actually aiming for a good example. So here's the good example. Uh, in the Helm charts repo from the stable disk, uh, which is yes, uh, it's a bit long in the tooth, uh, but this is the example that I was actually looking for when I thought of Bookstack. Uh, can we all see, no, it's not moving forward. I'm not sure what to do about this. Okay, so here's our good example that we're looking for. Um, it has a storage uh, section for configuring the storage in the Helm chart, and you can set an existing claim. 
So we're gonna do a Helm install now, um, the old fashioned way, actually. Yes, this is GitOpsCon, but uh, I promise before too long we will get to GitOps. So we are intentionally, uh, we don't need GitOps to have this problem, let's put it that way. We're trying to get ourselves into a jam and uh, we don't need GitOps to illustrate the problem. Uh, but it's part of our ideal solution later. It looks like I have to flip back and forth a few times. I'm just gonna try to do that and not talk about it. Okay, so. We started with this question. What happens when the PVC goes away? We're gonna answer it. Um, right now. Okay, so here's a screenshot. Uh, hopefully this is visible or at least semi-visible. Uh, I'm doing Helm install and just to note at this point as a consumer of the chart, we actually may have no idea that it's doing this. It's creating persistence on our behalf. Um, and that's good and bad. Uh, the keen observer at this point may notice something else interesting. We have persistent stores for storage and uploads. Uh, which the distinction is not important here, but what you should notice is that we have no persistence for MariaDB. Uh, that's not good. So that's okay, we're just asking questions right now. Uh, we wanna know if the persistent volume can be deleted and whether that's going to become a disaster for us. Um, and uh, so let's un uninstall and find out. Um, that's right. Uh, it wasn't deleted. Wait, they're perfectly safe. Both volumes, wait, our one volume is perfectly safe. What? I can't hear you. And it's gone. Uh, so, all right, what do we learn? Um, it's not a disaster yet. It's a policy decision. We have chosen, or Kubernetes has chosen for us to make the default policy delete. Um, retain, recycle, delete are all valid reclaim policy settings. Uh, but recycle's not very interesting, so let's say our choices are retain and delete. So we told Kubernetes to delete it. Uh, yes, it's the default. And where is that default from? Uh, here it is in the storage class. You see that reclaim policy uh, of delete in the storage class. Um, did we not mention before that each persistent volume inherits its settings from a parent storage class? No, we did not. Okay, so um, we can edit it in place. No, actually we can't edit it in place. Uh, updates are forbidden. So we have to define this when the storage class is created. So we'll just have to patch the PV after it's created. So that's what we'll do. All right, so back around to where we started, but we're adding one thing we learned. We have to enable persistence for MariaDB. It doesn't come out of the box that way. Um, and another problem, uh, all these resource have reclaim policy of delete. So uh, there's a piece of Kubernetes docs. We are not advancing the slides. There, there. And let's talk about what problem did we solve? Um, we should not be unceremoniously deleting our important data. So uh, what we prevent from being deleted through the uh, regular Helm lifecycle, uh, we can do that by setting the reclaim policy to retain. So, um, and also we've added another persistent store. So we have really only dug the hole deeper at this point, uh, but one thing at a time, we're building up to it. All right, let's uninstall the chart. Ooh, that's interesting. They did not all get the same status. I wonder why. Ah, that's interesting. I bet that has something to do with it. This one still has its claim. Uh, maybe it's a stateful set thing. Hmm. Let's have a look at that PVC. Oh boy, that is a lot. Anything we can do to clean it up? Uh, yes, there is kubectl neat. Kubectl neat. We'll trim it down a bit. Uh, this does, uh, what it does here is worth uh, pause to talk about for a minute. 
So this is kubectl neat, a crew plugin. Um, this just goes through that resource definition and it takes out anything that's been added by Kubernetes as an expanded default. And it does a few other things to make this resource uh, safe to apply and reapply on a continuous loop. Um, it uh, doesn't quite do everything we need for persistent volumes. So we're gonna take a few of these annotations away from the persistent volume claim uh, there, where there's one for um, bind completed and one for bound by controller. We're just gonna wipe those out. Then uh, we are going to, uh, we have another detail. We can't really have known in advance um, that Kubernetes is about to fill out which node the persistent volume should attach to. Uh, it has this wait for, first, wait for first consumer setting back in the storage class. So when the pod is created uh, on a node and scheduled, that's when the persistent volume is created according to the configuration in the storage class. Okay. So we now have solved another problem. Uh, we know how to prepare a PV and a PVC definition for rebinding. Uh, but we just understood the relationship a little bit better. Uh, well, this isn't actually a problem we've encountered yet, right? Uh, but Helm creates a persistent volume claim which spawns a PV, and we need them both to complete the puzzle. So now we can recall that our PVCs were deleted, uh, except for the Maria DB. So we can reconstruct. We could we could reconstruct them, but we're still just poking around. So let's uh, put the delete policy back and just wipe them out. Okay, and then when we delete that claim, the volume is really gone again, okay? So we haven't really uh, solved the problem yet, but uh, so, okay. There is a video here of, we're gonna try this again. And uh, so we pipe each PV and PVC through kubectl neat and save them on disk make the changes as we illustrated here. I'm not gonna play all these videos because we don't have time, but hopefully you have an imagination and uh, there will be more help later for in case you don't have an imagination. So. Now my screen is not updating. I'm still on slide 56. All right, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Here we go. Okay, so once more, we're gonna do a Helm install uh, with the same options as before. We're gonna patch the resource with the retain reclaim policy. We're gonna pipe each PV and PVC through kubectl neat. We're gonna save them on disk. Is this going to work this time? There's only one way to find out. Let's reapply those definitions. And finally, um, well, uh, the short version is it did not work. There is more um, behind this video to see, but uh, we, uh, we missed one thing, we needed to erase the node affinity. Uh, it's not pictured in the previous video. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, my slide is just not updating. Okay, so why did this not work? Here's another important thing. Um, no, it did not work because we uh, we forgot the database password no longer matches what we have in the database itself. That's pretty complicated, but Helm is generating us a random password for each install. Um, and uh, first time MariaDB runs, it actually records that information in the database. And if it doesn't match again later, well, MariaDB won't start. So if you're following along at home now, um, it's start, starting to heat up. So we've got a nice collection of values here. We're actually gonna put them in a file, values.yaml. And uh, if you'd like to give this a try here, uh, yeah, so we know we need to set the password. Actually, I'm gonna skip one step here and say there's two passwords we need to set because there's a root user in the database and there's also a user user. So we're gonna do that. We are going to uh, uninstall and then apply these definitions to the cluster with Helm. So here's our amended list for now. Is this going to work? Uh, we've added passwords to the list this time. And if you follow the video, this time you know it's working. Uh, 
you, you better believe me, it took two tries to get that right. Yeah, the two password thing that uh, I tripped over that at least twice. So now, all we're missing is Git. So if you're new to GitOps, I hope that this whole uh, beginner's journey hasn't scared you away. But remember that we set out to do just one thing for now, and we've done it, right? So uh, we can, uh, we're going to do the speed run, actually, of how do we get this into Flux? How do we get it into Git and, and use that as part of our disaster recovery solution? So there is another video that should go here. Um, and I apologize, I've been working up to the last minute. Um, so, uh, but if you've read the Flex docs from cover to cover, uh, this one might not be familiar uh, because it's a bit new. It's about encrypting values.yaml uh, and storing it for use in a secret. Uh, then how to use that secret with a Flux Helm controller Helm release um, to drive the operation of your Helm chart. So here's uh, the Helm repository. We're going to create it using the Flux CLI, and then we're going to use Flux export source git. And here is that uh, Helm release uh, repository, a little bit zoomed in with some details highlighted. We've actually, because there's a reason that the stable repo was deprecated, uh, it's large and unwieldy. So we actually have to increase the timeout to make this work. And we're going to do the same for the Helm release, convert the Helm install command to a declarative form. OK. Uh, so there are some details from that last page that you uh, ought to read the Flux docs to understand if they're not immediately obvious. But there's one that I'll talk about here. The values from is part of the guide I linked to a few slides ago. And uh, this is straight out of that guide. This is customized config.yaml. Um, this points to a field in the Helm release. Uh, it doesn't need any changes. This one uh, does change just a little bit. Okay, prior uh, to this, I was using pod info. And uh, so let's change to bookstack. And then let's make sure that all the file names match what we've created. Uh, we're going to need that values.yaml file that we created earlier also. So, uh, and oh, this reminds us we're going to have to declare the namespace if we want this to work with GitOps. Now, I think that is everything, uh, except one more thing. All right, we said we we're going to have secrets in a values.yaml file, so that means we need to encrypt it. Um, and that means we need a SOPS configuration. So if you do follow that link uh, that I posted before, this is the same link. And it has information uh, connected to the SOPS guide in Flux to tell you how to set up SOPS from scratch um, with Flux. So. All right, so we're going to do that. I'm just going to follow the guide and not talk about it. And commit everything to Git. And uh, Flux's Helm controller is going to take over this release. And if we've lined everything up correctly, then you should see Helm controller taking over the Helm release. Um, you should have Flux bootstrapped already at this point. Um, thanks, Pinky and Simtochi. Uh, throughout the day, you'll see Flux bootstrap. We're not going to do it here. Uh, but hopefully we've already seen enough of that, or we'll see enough of that. And um, hey, it worked. Cool. So there's our, our Bookstack wiki. Uh, we've restored it, and it actually has all the data still on it. So what's missing at this point? Actually, uh, we still don't have a backup. That was the first thing we wanted to do. So that's, that could be a problem. Um, but we're, we're well prepared now for what comes next. OK. so. Check out this talk from last year's KubeCon that already covered CSI snapshots at large. Um, and we can use them in GitOps, I'm sure, although unfortunately I can't prove that right here as I'm about to tell you more about why. Um, and there, uh, yeah, there are still some problems for us. So uh, we cannot manage our Azure snapshots. I don't think I mentioned that I am on Azure here. Uh, but with GitOps, we cannot, measure, we cannot manage our Azure snapshots without getting another third-party tool involved. Uh, Kubernetes cannot do it directly. Azure does not support it. And this is actually not too uncommon. Um, I did not start on Azure when I was preparing this. I wanted to make it accessible, uh, so I tried not to make it about the Synology file server that I have at home that has uh, an open source CSI driver that does support the common snapshot interface. 
Uh, so the demo is basically all the same there. And if you don't have one at home, you can try it on um, these clouds. Uh, and if anybody shouts an AM right now that also supports external snapshots, I will happily add it to this list. Uh, no questions asked. So, okay, let's move on. So there's some documentation that I've been working on to go with this talk. Uh, disaster Recovery Runbook. Uh, this is the beginning of a runbook that will eventually cover everything we've discussed here and more. Uh, but it needs some work yet. So I don't think I can do this by myself. Um, but you can help. I'm sorry the slides are not in better sync with what I'm saying, uh, but uh, hopefully it's still possible to follow. So um, get used to saying that you need help, I need help. Future you needs help from present you, or maybe present you needs help right now. Um, if you need help, you know where to find us, I hope. Uh, we're in the CNCF Slack, or I am, uh, Kingdon B, and I'm usually in the Flux channel. So this runbook has a section uh, that is focused on what to do in a disaster. Uh, it assumes you will have already followed all of the architecture guidance. So the architecture section is much longer. Um, the runbook is short. I thought for a while about how to publish this. I decided not to use Bookstack. Um, okay, so lesson number one. Actually, let's back way up. Uh, don't get yourself into jams if you can simply avoid it. In this case, it would have been uh, absolutely avoidable. MariaDB can be run externally. You can refer to it as an attached resource in a secret, just like we've been doing since 2011 or earlier, as described by 12Factor. Uh, if your organization is large and fairly competent, it is highly likely that they have backups worked out already to a science. Uh, so if figuring that stuff out is your job, then I hope this talk has helped. Um, if you don't have such guidance, you may want to start with a better resource than my run book that I started um, three months ago. So there is prior art uh, without a focus on GitOps. Valero actually solves most of these problems and others too. Now, uh, about snapshots, Another thing to consider is uh, if your snapshots are housed in a resource group or another analog like we have on Azure, they can be cascade deleted. So if you're creating snapshots as your plan for a backup, uh, well, that's not the only limitation, right? Uh, we talked about mixing secrets in, in our values.yaml file with the rest of the configuration. Is that really the best way to do it? I don't think so. I think you should put your secrets in a, a purpose-built secret store like Vault or uh, any KMS solution um, that you can access with an external secrets operator. Uh, but it does have limitations when you use that with Flux. Uh, Flux customized controller needs those things together. So that example that I showed and the other examples that are in the family, the config map, and um, there, there are a couple of examples there. If you follow that link and just scroll up a little bit, there are examples without encryption for things that aren't secrets on how to use a config map generator or a secret generator and customize. And you need the secret right there in order to do that. It needs to be decrypted in the context of customize. So um, there, there is some stuff to think about here. So let's talk about the risks again. You might have a single cloud account. Um, say the mode of failure is a total account takeover. This is actually a kind of similar scenario in that we may have lost access to the account and we're unable to recover it or we've lost access to the snapshots like we would have if we deleted the resource group. Uh, case in point, you need a backup outside. So what else can we do for backups? Well, if your architecture for backups and uh, disaster recovery planning includes these possibilities, well, you probably are gonna wanna check out Restic uh, it has many scenarios for copying in ways that weren't supported or desired to be supported by upstream APIs, like the Azure API. Now, we can't show them all here today, unfortunately, due to time constraints, but uh, we will add these things to the runbook soon, and we will continue adding them as uh, people are interested, if that 
should come to pass. Um, if we're not prepared to go outside of what our cloud provider supports natively, there are other solutions we can approach, too. So you can lock the resources, um, again, using the Azure API or the Azure portal to prevent their deletion. I'm sure other cloud providers likely have a uh, similar structure that's available. And Terraform also has the prevent destroy lifecycle setting which uh, if you're using Terraform, but again, one can just comment that out and run it again. So that's really not a complete solution. So what else can we do? We said offsite backups, something we wanna consider. Um, they should not live in the same cloud account if we wanna protect against a total account takeover or really anywhere that's accessible from that account. Uh, so we've reached the end of our content. And uh, you can take a picture of this again if you missed it earlier. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I think we might have time for a question or two. We do, yeah. Yeah. One over there. We've got a microphone on the way here. So all the steps you were going through to create a backup manifest of the persistent volume claim, persistent volumes, so what, ultimately, what did you do with that manifest? I, that was a little bit, I wasn't sure about that. It was, was that to put it back into your own version of the Helm chart or put it somewhere else? What we did with that, uh, maybe I did skip over that a little bit. So what we did, we uninstalled the Helm chart um, or we, uh, yeah, we, we did uninstall it. So we, we have taken an initial definition, the values.yaml with here, this is the slide. This is what we did. We took on the left, where we have no existing claim defined in our initial installation, and we have storage enabled so that the volumes will be created by Helm, and then we took them over. We captured their definitions, we stored them in Git, um, and we changed a few things. We changed existing claim to refer to the existing claim, and at this point, um, I uninstalled the chart and reinstalled it. I had a problem when I tried just straight upgrading it there. Uh, but the, actually the problem uh, somewhere in here, you'll notice if you didn't believe me when I said it all worked at the very end here, here is an, a mistake. It's not called my book stack release, it's called my book stack wiki. So I did have an error <laughs> at the very end uh, and I had to fix that. I wound up uninstalling and reinstalling. But after that, now your volumes are part of your definition. They exist, and as long as they exist, or they can be restored to where they were, or another place, now you can do a full restore on a new cluster. So you tear down the cluster, you bootstrap a new cluster, and it should restore all of the data from all of your persistent volumes. This works basically on every CSI driver with minor variations. Thanks. Yeah, all right, great. Come visit me at the Flux booth. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Keenan. <laughs>